Sounds like you're having a real good time talking to one another. That's good. That's, that's, that's what I like to hear. Uh, good to see some of you have been away, back again. Thanks for being here. Uh, we're going to do things a little different. Oh, by the way, I'm not Ed. Anybody know that? I'm, I'm sorry. So it's not going to be exactly the same. But uh, we're going to start with another little chorus kind of song before we go to the prayer. It's on page 26 of so your hymnals. It's not in your, in your bulletin. I, I know that's terrible, but we're doing it. So would you stand with me as we sing, This is the Day. We're singing through twice. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Amen. Would you bow with me as we pray? Father, we thank you that this is a day that you've made, and we give you the recognition of that. We thank you for your many blessings in our lives, and even the trials we face can become blessings as we keep our eyes fixed on you. So thank you for this day. You've allowed us to come together. I pray for those who can't be here due to, to other uh, obligations or to uh, sickness. We pray that you'd touch their hearts and bless them and their bodies and heal them. And Father, thank you that uh, we can be here today so you guide our time, please. Thank you for giving us a day, and we'll give you the praise whenever we do. And we ask that uh, you uh, guide us through this service in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for a second, and then we'll probably have you jump back up again. Just uh, on the announcements, just to check your bulletin there, things that uh, are coming out, VBS on the August 6th, and uh, it's uh, a three, maybe three and a half uh, hour ex excursion until we have a final uh, lunch, I guess. Uh, we're doing Dinosaur Dig. That's something that uh, Jerry and Kay had put together for the fairs a few years ago. And we're shaving it way down, but we're going to focus on some of the same things. Uh, so if you uh, know some young ones or you can bring some, that'll be great on Saturday, uh, August 6th at 9 o'clock. And we're going to have a great time there. Uh, then also Bob and Brenda are going to host a contemporary service. And we're thankful for that. Looking forward to that August 13th at 5. Uh, also, we have a board meeting in the morning on August, uh, August uh, 13th. So, uh, as Ed would say, everybody's invited, not just the board. Anybody can come, and we welcome that. On the, on the 14th, we have a missionary service with Ted Burnfield. Uh, looking forward to seeing Ted. I've uh, been uh, seeing him many times at different uh, things in Christian Union, and uh, he's, uh, he, he uh, is, a, is a blessing whenever he shows up. So we're looking forward to that. Church camp, one more to go. Um, I don't know I have any testimonies today from anyone who was there. Uh, I don't, uh, maybe a little bit farther back to see if they want to kind of share. And then uh, this one coming up is the, is the beginner's camp. Uh, John and Penny will be running that. And uh, so uh, I know Linda's real excited about being working in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and and Gerald, Gerald that's, the, that's the worst look you ever gave me. I don't know. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, you'll do great. I know that. So uh, camp is a place of transition. And uh, so uh, uh, I, may, I may ask for some testimony here in a moment. But let's, uh, before we do that, any other announcements that things are coming up that I'm forgetting about? Uh, you may know better than I do. Over there. There, sorry. Oh, yeah. uh, there is choir practice where I can preach today real quick, and then next week I will get you guys the new schedule so that the one we have already over after this month. So please be here next week. 
Okay? Uh, I just heard from Ethan, he's doing pretty good. He made the advanced top 10% of his class. He graduates on uh, September 23rd. Okay. And I've got, uh, I think Holly put the address on the bulletin board. Okay, he good. He doesn't know where he's going to go after that. So. Yeah. All right. Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Anything else? All right, let's stand and turn with me to number 596. 596. Sit down again. Say I'm gonna yeah, get your exercise if I'm here. And I know I see some people I think went to camp over here. Uh, one last week, one the week before. And I'd like to know how things went or what was the most awesome thing about camp. Okay, I'm picking you. <laughs> You hear that? You hear that in the back? Best part was what? The church service, he said, was the best. Amen. Yeah. Are these mics on? Is this on? There we go. Is this on? I know it's been two weeks, but you haven't forgotten much. Yeah, what he said. What he said? <laughs> no, 
There we go. <laughs> How about from last week? Anybody? Not, who, who, who's expecting to go? Anybody want to go? All right. All right. Okay, so. Okay, all right. So we got a lot of involvement this summer at camp, and that's a great thing. Uh, it's a great camp. Sandy and I used to live on the campground for uh, a dozen years uh, as, uh, as dean of the college down there. So we've gone through a lot of camps together, but we've been gone from there for six years. So you guys, anybody that's gone from the church then, we don't, aren't, we don't know. So. Okay, any favorites on food? Probably the jello cake. Mine was chicken and noodles over mashed potatoes. Did they have that? Yeah, okay. Or sausage gravy and biscuits. Did they have that? Yeah. There, okay. I know. I know some of the I know some of the menu. Yeah. No, no mine. I'll show you chicken. Chicken? Okay. All right. So, hey, great memories. Now, anybody else got anyone to, to share? We usually do this at the end of the service, but maybe you've got something you want to share. I don't know. If, go ahead. Looking forward to what God's going to do this coming week and what he's going to do in the years ahead as we all get involved. And uh, I'm excited about that. All right, now it's time to exercise. Get up again <laughs> and turn to 105. Slow it down a little bit. 105. This time we'll have the ushers come forward for the morning offering. (laughs) 
Bob, would you ask a, la- a blessing on the offering? stand for the doxology. Be seated and uh, children are dismissed to Junior Church. And I think Lori's got something to share with us. Look on me with love and watch me rise.
Aren't you glad that God's a good catcher? When we're falling, he's going to catch us. He's done it over and over again. That's a great thing to remember. Well, good morning again. Now, you already know I'm not Ed, so we'll, we'll see what I can do from there. Um, have you ever... Anybody ever on a vac vacation? No? What's a vacation? Yeah. Vacation. All right. I can, I can get loud, Tom. I'll try. So sometimes you just get up and go, right? Other times you've got a lot of planning to do. And, uh, and sometimes we have some really good expectations about what's going to happen. We've got everything down, everything packed, everything there, and nothing goes the way we expected. We have trouble on the road. We get there, and it's not what we thought it was going to look like, or uh, a million other things. And so, you know, it's important for us to realize that even in those frustrating things, we're a child of God, and we're, he's with us all along the way. Uh, something else we're going to go on, last week we started a series on following Jesus, and we're going to continue that theme for several weeks. But uh, I wonder what it would be like, anybody meet somebody famous, you know, maybe? Uh, I can think, a friend of mine, a pastor in Lima, a few weeks ago did a funeral for, uh, uh, no, my mind's blank, the, what's his name? Yeah. Football coach, no, football player uh, from Pittsburgh. Thank you. You know, senior moment. So Ben Roethlisberger's grandma died, and she was from Lima. 
And so uh, my friend was a pastor, so he got to talk to Ben Roethlisberger for, you know, several minutes. And so he probably enjoyed that. As a matter of fact, he's told us in the Kairos group several times already how, much, how, how nice that was. And that Ben actually read a scripture during the, during the service. So, you know, those are things that you just not, you can prepare for certain things, and then there's surprise things that happen. And I want us to think about today, I started this series on following Jesus, and last week was the fact that we had to identify who Jesus was, and we looked at that in John chapter 1. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1, we're going to finish thinking about this today, but before we do again, uh, I just need to pray. So bow your heads with me. Father, it is so important for us to be students of the Word of God and, and that always seeking to know you better through our study of your Word, through our just reading of the Word, and allowing it to sink into our lives. Father, I pray that you would guide our service now, that you might help us to learn from you and uh, help us see what the Word of God says and then to, to see how it can affect our lives as we seek to be someone who is following Jesus every day. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we, we did part one. We, talk, we asked the question, who is Jesus? And in chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 29 down to 34, we spent time looking at that. We identified several things about Jesus. John the Baptist said, here's, here's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So he talks about the Lamb. He talks about a man. John says, there's a, th this man, there's a man coming after me that is greater than I. He's the one that God is going to call and he's the one you need to learn about. And then he talks about that, um, that this one, this man, this lamb, was the one that's revealed by God. He was revealed to John that he's the Messiah. And he'll be revealed through John. The, the, ch uh, the children of Israel will, will learn through John that he is the Messiah. And then uh, we also looked at the testimony of John. When he saw the Spirit descending on Jesus, he saw the Spirit remaining on Jesus, and John knows that Jesus is the promised Messiah. And in the final verse 34 we looked at last time, it simply reads this, And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. And so Sandy in Sunday school even went through a whole lot of different titles that Jesus has. But we're, we're important for us, and what I'm thinking about is we're doing this, this study on, or, or this series on following Jesus. We had to identify who he was. And there's all sorts of passages in the scripture that give us an identity of who Jesus is. He is the Messiah. He is the Lamb of God that's going to take away the sins of the world. He is the great I Am. He is all these things. And so now that we've identified him, we continue this story in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. I'm going to read this, uh, a few of these verses, and then we'll come back and think them through. So John chapter 1, verse 35 through 39, this is what it reads. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Same thing he said the day before. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them uh, following, said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher, little parenthesis there, uh, Rabbi, and, and uh, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and see. Then they came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. It's interesting how John puts a bunch of, bunch of parentheses in this, in this chapter, but here we are. So I... Today's um, following Jesus part two is meeting Jesus. People, there's got to be a time in our life where we meet him. There's one time in our life when we recognize who he is, identify him. But then we have to meet him. And so it's interesting, in this chapter, there are four different people that meet Jesus, and we're going to look at them. So the first ones are... Uh, I like to ask questions. Who's here? Who's in this story? Well, John, 
It's John the Baptist, not John the Apostle. John the Apostle is writing the account. John the Baptist is in the account. Okay, so John's there, John the Baptist. Two of his disciples are there, and Jesus is there in that portion of Scripture that I just read. John the Baptist, two disciples, and Jesus. And so uh, when did this take place? Well, in chapter 1, the beginning, uh, verses 19 and down to to 28 is the first day. We, did, we talked a little bit about that last time, about what happened with John. And then on verse 39, it says the next day, so it's this second day that we looked at last week. Now it says in verse 35, again, the next day. So this is day three. You say, ah, big deal. Well, I don't know if it's a big deal or not, but we're going to look at this. So it's actually, we've got this timeline that's pretty progressive down to what's happening as Jesus is preparing to start his ministry, his public ministry. And so in the passage last week, Jesus is there, but he never says anything, not that it's recorded for us. And this time, John says the same thing he said the day before, there's the Lamb of God. He doesn't add that phrase uh, that uh, has come to take away the sins of the world, but he says the Lamb of God so these two disciples, whatever they're standing around talking to John about, all of a sudden Jesus starts coming up and John points to him again, says, there's that lamb I told you about. And so they stopped listening to John and started walking towards Jesus. And so uh, it's the next day. Where did it happen? Somewhere along the Jordan River, somewhere probably close to the Sea of Galilee where John is baptizing in the Jordan River and he's still probably traveling as, as he's going. We don't know. It doesn't give us all that information. And then the question comes up, what happened? Well, John points out Jesus to his followers, to John's followers. There's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so as he does that, the two disciples start following Jesus. They turn, they follow him, and uh, when they do that, we see something we haven't seen before in this context. It says, the two disciples heard him speak, that's John, and they followed Jesus. They were followers of John, and now they're going to follow Jesus. They don't know how much they're going to follow Jesus, but they want to find some things out about this Lamb of God, what's going on here. And so they follow Jesus. And what the, the strange thing is, in verse, verse 38, it says, Then Jesus turned and seeing them following. In other words, he turns and these guys are kind of behind him, getting closer and closer. He sees them. That uh, he, he says to them, What do you seek? Now, it hit me as I was going through this that this is a, one of the, early times that, that we have a record of something Jesus actually says. And it's kind of strange. What do you seek? And uh, if we go to Matthew and his, and his gospel, chapter 3, we have the story of, of Jesus being baptized by John. And in that scenario, John says to Jesus, I, I don't want to baptize you. I, I, you need to baptize me. I'm not, you're not worthy to baptize you. And Jesus simply says, in, in a paraphrase, go ahead, it has, go ahead and baptize me. It's something that has to be done. That's, that's probably the first recording, recorded time when Jesus speaks, except one way back in Luke. And this is when he's a child, when he's 12 years old. He's, they go to the Passover. You know the story. And uh, as, they're, as everybody's going back home, Jesus isn't with them. And what I thought was interesting, and I'm just going to read this from Luke chapter 1 or, or 2, I mean. Luke chapter 2, the, it says in verse 45, and I'm not going to go through the whole story, but here's, here's a recorded, this is the first recorded anything that Jesus said. Now, he talked a lot, I'm sure, before that, but as far as what's recorded in the scripture, this is what he says as a child. When they come and say, where are you at? You worried us. We're, we're worried. In verse 49, he says, And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? 
these men in uh, John chapter 1, when he turns to say, this, to say to them, he says, What do you seek? Why did you seek me, mom and, and stepdad? And here he says, What do you seek? As these men come closer. And so here Jesus, as he starts his public ministry, as he start, we start to hear him speak in the scriptures, see what he has to say. He says that to them, what do you seek? What do you seek? He spoke to them, and then Jesus invites them to come with him. He said, um, Rabbi, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. It was about the 10th hour, which is about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And so they see Jesus, recognize who he is. He's been identified by John. Now they want to hear him. They want to see him. They want to meet him. And so they go up and they meet him and he invites them to come. As I was thinking about this, what did they talk about? Why didn't God in his wisdom give us some of that conversation about what these two guys did when they went to be with Jesus? I'm sure they didn't just sit down in the tent or wherever he was staying and uh, just look at each other. But we don't know what they did. I mean, they, there's so many things they could, could talk. They could ask stuff that John would talk about. about uh, how about that Abrahamic covenant when, when God told Abraham to leave his, his nation and he was going to make him into a new nation and he was going to have a blessed life and he was going to be a blessing to the whole world and all those things that what that meant. I, he, they could be asking questions about or, or or the promise, the covenant with David, when he said, "David, you'll never have a throne that won't be sit on by anybody but your descendants." And then there is, "You will have someone sit on it forever." It's an eternal throne that someone will sit on from David's line. I mean, I could think of all sorts of questions that might have been there. We don't know, and evidently God thought we didn't need to know yet. But I think it's something that's important to kind of touch base with. So the first meeting is with these two men. And so it said, we don't know who they are yet, just two disciples of John. Uh, and then we want to read the next passage, which is verse 40 through 42. So we, we have the two. And then in verse 40, John 41, verse 40, it says, One of the two who heard him speak and followed him, now they're following Jesus, Followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So one of the two is named now, it's Andrew. And so Andrew and his friend, and, you know, spoiler alert, but I think it's John, the writer of the Gospel of John, is the other guy. Uh, so Andrew and probably John uh, have had some time with Jesus, and now Andrew decides, i got to get my brother. And so he goes... Uh, it says in ver verse 41 says, And he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah. In all these passages I've talked about, we haven't, any, other than me telling you that it's about the Messiah, this is the first time it actually says the Messiah. Um, and so Andrew's saying, Whatever he talked about in that private setting, it verified John the Baptist is right. This guy is not just a prophet. This guy is the Messiah we've been looking for, we've been planning on, we've been waiting for um, this, this guy to show up for hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, we kind of gave up. And now things are starting to change. And John says, I'm the, I'm the one that's going to pronounce the coming, and he's hit, he's it, he's the Messiah. And so... Andrew can't stop but run to his brother and say, we found him. We have found the Messiah, which is translated, parenthesis, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And so here's Andrew. He goes and um, tells his brother. And then they both go back to Jesus. And he brought him to Jesus. I like Andrew. Anytime you see him, he's trying to bring somebody to Jesus. This is the first time. Because he knows we need him. We need Jesus in our life. And Andrew knew, even though his, his brother was a devout Jew, and a, even though he's, he worked as a fisherman, 
he loved God and sought to please God. And so he says, I got to go tell Peter. And he found him, said to him, we found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And then Jesus looked at him, that's looked at Peter. And Jesus said, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which translated stone. And there's no explanation in the context of what that means. And a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, theologians have pulled out some different ideas about that. And I'm not even going to touch those today. Because I'm just l- looking to see who, who, who it is that meets Jesus first. So Andrew and probably John with him are the first ones to meet Jesus. The day before, John the Baptist pointed him out. But this time, he sends his followers say, there he is. And they, and they just took off. And they saw he was. So Andrew goes and gets his brother Simon. Now we got three people seeing who this is. And Jesus, whatever he meant to share with, with Peter, hooked him. He's believing the same thing Andrew believes. He's believing the same thing the other disciple believed. So who's in this story, in this, in this second meeting? Well, Andrew, Peter, and Jesus. It happened the same day as the one we just looked at. There's the same place. Uh, Andrew, one of John's disciples, goes and finds Peter and tells him about Jesus, that Jesus is the Messiah, and Jesus gives Peter a new name, the stone or the rock. Why? Why would he do this? Well, it starts with the first passage because that's when Jesus begins his public ministry. He's going to keep doing this and become more and more public. More and more people are going to see him. More and more people have the opportunity to come to him. And uh, why? wherefore is another question. Why would it happen? And, and what happens because of this truth we find out? Well, Jesus come to take away the sin of the world. And everything he does is leading to that point where he's going to make it possible for the sin, our sins to be forgiven. And the whole world has an opportunity. So here in the second one, he's, he's calling them to make disciples, starting to grow some who are going to follow him because they've met him. Well, we'll continue on. And then in verse uh, 43, there's a third meeting. The following day, okay, we've gone to another day. This is the following day, which would be actually the fourth day of all the stories here in chapter one the following day jesus wanted to go to galilee and he found philip and said to him follow me so i don't know where peter and andrew and possibly john are we don't know right that moment but he's going to travel and he sees someone else it's philip he tells philip hey follow me now philip was from Bethsaida, a city of Andrew and Peter, somewhere uh, close to uh, the Jordan River where John was baptizing. So Philip, it says, uh, so he knew Andrew, he he knew Peter. And so Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So now we have Jesus, we have Philip, we have Nathaniel. The other guys, maybe they, you know, are packing up some bags to go or whatever. We don't know. But uh, so Philip finds his buddy and he says, here's the one who Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. So we're getting an expanded identity of Jesus that we started with last week. That he is, he is, uh, uh, that Moses talked about him, the prophets talked about him, and uh, it's Jesus of Nazareth, of that little town up north. This Jesus of Nazareth is all these things we've been looking for. He is the Messiah. We found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. All those things written in the Old Testament are pointing to this Messiah, this Jesus. So, again... It's the following day, the fourth day, somewhere along the Jordan River, probably close to the Sea of Galilee. Jesus meets Philip. Jesus invites Philip to follow him. This time, he initiates the questioning. He says, hey, Philip, why don't you come follow me? We don't know what's going on in Philip's life or why this, but he he wants to make sure his, his buddy knows about this. 
And so he went and found Nathanael and he said, hey, we've got the Messiah. He's here. He's finally here. All right. So we've, Andrew's met Jesus. John's met Jesus. John, the writer of the gospel. Peter's met Jesus. Philip's met Jesus. And now there's this Nathanael guy. And so here's, uh, here's the last section of Scripture. Verse uh, 47 of chapter 1 of John says this. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, oh, I missed a verse, didn't I? I do need to look at it. We are in verse 46, sorry. Let me do that first. After... Philip identifies Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. It says, Then Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Well, come and see. Sorry, that's an important verse. Because Nathanael said, you, That can't be the Messiah. If he's from Nazareth, that's, he's supposed to come from Bethlehem. Don't you know your Old Testament? Well, he didn't know an Old New Testament then. Don't you know the writings? And he says, And besides that, if it's, Nazareth's got some really nasty people living there, and no one likes them. So uh, how could the Messiah be coming from there? And so Philip doesn't, doesn't try to defend Jesus, doesn't try to explain Jesus. You know, he says, well, come and see for yourself. Uh, if you don't think it's him after you see him, that, you know, nothing's lost. You better come and see him. Come and see him. And that brings us to verse 47, where I started. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Okay, that's kind of a strange greeting. And so Nathanael, in verse 48, responds and said to him, How do you know me? Wait a minute. How can you know that about me? I've never met you. You've never met me. How, how can you say I, that about me if you've never met me? I mean, it's a nice thing to know that I'm not a guy that's deceitful. I'm honest, and I follow the law. I follow God's word that's been written in the Old Testament. Um, how do you know this? How, how can you even say that? And he said to him, and Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, I don't know, I didn't have a phone, but somehow he got a hold of him. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. What? What's he talking about? That makes no sense to us. But evidently, and some people use trees as a place of shade when they study the word and they can sit down and meditate on the truths they're looking at in the scriptures. And evidently, somewhere along the line, Nathaniel must have been doing that because, oh, I saw you when you were under the fig tree. And maybe he was wrestling with this whole idea of who the Messiah is and what's he come to do and when's he coming and when's this going to take place and somehow he knows that he is, he is, he is trying or seeking to, to find some answers from God. And Jesus said, I saw you over there. And it means that that place was nowhere in sight where Jesus would have seen him. So how did he see him there? And whatever that means, and we, we can speculate on that all you want, but whatever it means, here's what Nathaniel's reaction is when he heard this, that he saw him. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you're the son of God. Whatever was going on in his own personal quiet time under there, some connection with God, something he asked, something he did, maybe he said, I need to see the Messiah, whatever it is, we don't know. But he, Jesus says, I was there with you under that tree miles from here. I was there. I saw you. And he said, I, I didn't see anybody there. And how did you know I was thinking about the Messiah? He doesn't say any of that here. But whatever it was, it so impressed him. They said, Rabbi, teacher, you're the son of God. That's a proclamation. That's, what, that's how John concluded his, his uh, message the day before. That he is the son of God. Not only that, he adds something else. You are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. You see, all the promises in the Old Testament that came down through, through Abraham, down to David and the, the eternal kingdom and eternal throne, all that stuff about David. He is saying, you're that king that David wrote about, that God spoke about. 
You're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. And as we start to progress in our understanding and identifying who Jesus is, he's much more than just the king of Israel. He is the king of the world. He is my king and yours. And then Jesus, so Jesus saw Nathanael. Jesus spoke to him. Jesus commended him. Nathanael was surprised. Nathanael questioned Jesus. Nathanael declares Jesus is the Son of God and the King of Israel. And Jesus makes the, the final proclamation in this passage. Verse 50. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I have said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. He is, he is publicly gathering his apostles, gathering his disciples. And the more he gathers, the more it's going to be, you're going to be able to see how great and awesome Jesus is. And he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You are going to see things happen in the next couple years that no one has seen happen before in the history of mankind. Come on and follow me. God is real. God exists. Not the God that we make up in our mind and think this is what God will look like. It's the God who is proclaimed and explained in this book, the Word of God. And we can know him. And I hope everyone sitting here knows him. And we came through a progression of identifying who he is and to meeting with him and we'll look at some other things that are going to happen in the weeks ahead. But we see five people meet with Jesus. Andrew, maybe John, Peter, Philip, Nathaniel. Here's five people that are going to start following him. Because they've heard about him. And they have met him. And meeting him brings them into a closer understanding of who Jesus is. There's a passage from the Old Testament, and I, I usually type these out, but I want to look at this. I'm going to read this to you if I can find it. Jeremiah chapter 31. You say, what, what's the big deal, Neil? What's the big deal, Pastor, about this whole process? Well, the big deal is we, we live in a world that's lost, that has no concept of who God is, and are always seeking for answers, but never looking in the right place. The right place is to look to Jesus and see what he has to say. And he alone can change. And, and him showing up is the start of something that is talked about in the prophets. And here in Jeremiah chapter 31, simply says, down in verse, get it right, verse 31, chapter 31, verse 31. It says this, if I can get my focus. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, whom, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And there's some details to think about there, but the biggest thing is when Jesus finally showed up, and was identified and confirmed the identification that John says. And then he was willing to meet with those who are willing to find out who he, if he's really who he claims to be. That it's the beginning of this process that Jeremiah talked about that we're going to be, have a different kind of relationship with God. We will know him. Do 
This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. In those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds, write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Because Jesus came, God the Son came to live and die on that cross and to be buried. He arose the third day to prove his power over sin and death that somehow we can have a different kind of relationship that goes beyond the boundaries of Israel physically to the whole world if we simply turn our eyes toward Jesus and surrender our life to him. Jesus is the one who will never leave us or forsake us. He is the Messiah. And I know that, and I hope you know that, from personal experience. And the world around us needs to hear that God still loves them, God still can forgive them, and God has plan- given us a plan how that will work. And it all starts with Jesus. Why following Jesus? Because we need to follow him, we need to know who he is, we need to meet him, and we're going to see several other things we need to do that helps us in following Jesus. Father, thank you for the few moments we've had together today. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you that as we open it up, we can learn new things from you, about you, And Father, in that process, we can get instructions on how we ought to live our lives here and what difference we need to make. Father, if anyone's here today and does not know Jesus Christ, their Savior, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in their heart and they'd simply cry out and say, I need you. Save me. Give me a new life. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. And Father, I believe that that takes place, that someone's going to be transformed today. For those of us who are learning and struggling and maybe going through some difficult circumstances in our life, it's not a a surprise to you, Lord. It's not a surprise. And therefore, if we've been following you and we're having a difficult time, help us to just fix our eyes on Jesus. Help us to keep clinging to him. And Father, I know when we do that, we're going to have the right thing in our life. Thank you, Father, for providing us a Savior Help us to get to know him better as we continue to study your word. Thank you for bringing us together. Help us so live our lives that we're getting to know you and we're sharing your love with all those around us. And we ask you to continue to do that in this week. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me and turn to number 626?
Gentle Shepherd, we do need you. We need you to guide us. You need us to, to stand with us. You need to empower us. And Father, I pray again that this is what you do for us this week. And we ask it in the name above every name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we're dismissed. Unless you have something you want to share. In Christ is risen. Yeah, see, Ed wasn't here. So. I had... <laughs> So...